Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today we're continuing our series entitled Faith Revisited. And this is part four of our series entitled Hidden Faith. In our message today, I will try and show the importance of developing our faith and putting our faith into action. Because it's really, really important that our faith is developed by putting it into action. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. I also believe that if we do not put our faith into action, if we do not grow that mustard seed faith, we will have to give an account for it on the day of judgment. And the results will not be the most pleasant. Turn with me, please, to our scripture. Our scripture reading will be found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. This is the parable of the ten talents. Jesus is using this parable to describe the kingdom. It sounds very much to me like the day of judgment. What will happen on the day of judgment? All right. Let's, let's read our, our scripture. It's found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming, I could have received what was mine, my own, with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, so the parable starts out with the master given one servant ten talents, another five, and still another he gave only one. Please notice that this property belongs to the master. It does not belong to the servants. It says that he gave those servants his property. 
So they were to manage his property. It was not the servant's property. So the master shared up the money to each one according to their abilities. And then he went away. So first thing first, the master here is Jesus. Jesus is our master. Then second, the ability is actually faith or the faith, oho pistis. Jesus has gone away into heaven, but he has given each one of us a talent or talents according to our abilities. In other words, Jesus has given each of us giftings according to the measure of faith that we have, have also been given. He does not expect more than what we have received, but he does expect at least as much as we have received. We cannot say that we do not have any giftings. We cannot say that we have no faith. Each one has at least a, a talent of gifting, at least a talent of faith. It all depends on our ability. James tells us that faith without actions is dead. Inaction renders faith impotent. But we're going to cover more on that in our next, uh, later on in this series. But now look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For by grace given me, given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. See, God has given or assigned each and every one of us a measure of of faith. Therefore, we must think with sober judgment accordingly. But this word think is much more than just to, 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 to think, to, to, to consider. It's more like have a world view, something that, that, that initiates action. It, it, it causes us to, to, to uh, plan our life accordingly. It has to do with with our mind and the way that we react or interact to the things of God. See, the word has developed over the years, but in its earliest historic sense, and I, I want to quote, it was, e it was early regarded as the seat of intellectual and spiritual activity. The diaphragm determines the nature and strength of the breath and hence also the human spirit and its emotions. End of quote. It is the rational spiritual consideration that leads either to spiritual life or spiritual death. So why do we think or why should we think Think with sober judgment because just like those servants, those three servants, we too will have to give an account of our faith. So make no mistake, when Jesus returns, and I believe that his return is really, really soon, he will be looking for faith upon the earth and we, each one of us will have to give an account for the giftings and for the faith that we did or did not develop. I want you to take a quick look at Luke chapter 18, verse 8. And this is Jesus talking. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This faith that is mentioned here is the Greek word ohopistis, the faith. So Jesus is asking the question, when I return, will I find ohopistis, the faith upon the earth? Now, 
This is that mountain moving mustard seed faith that we have been studying about in this series. That's the kind of faith that sets our giftings in motion. And this is the faith that Jesus is coming back looking for. He's going to be looking for Oho Pistis, the faith. Now, here's the interesting part. I want us to consider now the servants. The first one comes and receives the five talents and trades and makes five more. The second comes and receives two talents and does the same exact thing by the same exact way. The same thing that the first did, the second did. But the third comes and receives as well. But he hides his talent in the ground. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 16. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. The scripture says that he received, which is the Greek word lambano, which means, according to the theological dictionary of the New Testament, and I quote, the original etymological meaning is the grasp to seize, end of quote. Now, this word develops in two directions, according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. And again, I want to quote. The first is active, to take, to bring under one's control, on one's own initiative, to take to oneself, to take captive, to collect. Example, to collect the revenue from possessions. Number two, the second direction gives us already in, in, in the classic Greek, the sense to receive, to acquire, but this one is passively, both a literal, but to receive or to acquire, you acquire those things passively. In religious statements, the negative denotes the divine an archi, God has received nothing because he possesses all things and wills to himself. Now, the middle is used actively to hold something or someone to oneself, to grasp someone or something, end of quote. Now, in other words, the first direction is an active personal initiative to take or to bring under your own control to grasp it and make it your own by your own initiative. There's nobody forcing you. There's nobody making you. You're doing this because you want to. This is your own initiative. The second direction is to receive some, somebody giving you something and you receive it, but you receive it Passively, or in other words, you take and hold something to yourself and not share it with others. There is no activity after receiving. And this is what that third servant did. He, he received it, but he received it passively. You see, mustard seed faith cannot grow unless it is shared. If we do not act on or live out our faith, it becomes stagnant as if we had hidden it into the ground. Again, James said that faith without action is dead. It is hidden in the ground. It's no good, it's impotent. So the first two servants received and acted on the receipt of what they were given and thus doubled what was given to them. So they use the first direction of that word, receive. The last servant, however, he also received, but he did not act, but rather he held it to himself and did not go out and, and double it, or he didn't, even, he, he didn't even make interest on it. 
And, and so he, he rendered it impotent. He hid his talent in the ground. People did not even know he was a Christian, much less receive Christian guidance from him. That's the type of man he was. He received, but he did not give out. He went to work. He sat with people who, who maybe were going through hardships, but he did not render the love of Jesus to them. He did not minister to them in a Christian manner. Now this Greek word, lambano, which is translated receive, and this receive, this word, this English word receive, is a compound word made up of two words, receive. Re, which means back or returning to a previous state, according to Webster's Dictionary. It also means back to the original place or position. The word receive means to take or to grasp. So could it mean that when these talents were handed out, they were to return to a previous state? And could that state that they were to return to, could that state be the state that we were in in the Garden of Eden? I want you to look at verse 16. Verse 16 says that, that the one with the five talents went out at once and traded and, and made a profit. In other words, he put that talent to work. And that word went is the Greek word, it's up on the screen, meaning to set in motion, to bring on the way, to convey, to lead, or to take over. But I want you to notice this. In non-biblical usage, this is what it means. And I quote, Journeys in the hereafter, the Septuagint, and later Judaism, in the literal sense, the meaning means to pass away. Transferred sense, the theological sense and the imperative use means going to death. Journeys in the hereafter. Philo and Josephus and the New Testament and the literal sense means going to death. Imperative use, the mission of Jesus, the mission of the apostles, the transferred moral and religious use means pardon discourses the ascension of Jesus, Jesus' descent into Hades, end of quote. Now armed with all of that information and all of that knowledge, could it be possible that the reason that the first two servants, since the scriptures indicate that they both did the exact same thing to achieve the exact same thing by doubling what they were given, could it be that they both after receiving their portion of faith, they both had to die to self in order to put faith to work, in order to double what it was that they were given. Remember, Jesus said that every day, every single day, we are to die to self. And every single day, we are to pick up our cross and we are to follow him. And those who, who love self, or love people, or love family, or, or, or love the world, is not worthy of Him. If we love things more than Jesus, we're not worthy of Jesus. If we love people more than Jesus, we're not worthy of Jesus. It's a hard teaching, but this is gospel. This is the good news. Jesus is the one who died for us. He didn't have to die for us. He didn't have to hang on that cruel Roman cross. He didn't have to have those nails pierced through his hands. He didn't have to have nails pierced through his feet. He didn't have to be beaten. He didn't have to have a crown of thorns pressed 
into his brow until the blood ran down his face. He didn't have to go through all of that torture because he has done nothing wrong. He could have just wiped out mankind and started all over, but he chose not to. Nobody took his life from him. He willingly laid down his life. So he did not have to do these things. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever, all we have to do is to believe. That's all we have to do. We don't have to go through no rituals. We don't have to go through penance and beat ourselves. We don't have to do any of that stuff. Jesus took all of that for us. All he requires is love and obedience. If you love him, you'll obey. And if you obey, you love. That's all he's asking. So is it too much to ask to love? I don't believe so. So Jesus says that if you love things, if you love others more than you love him, who be in God in himself, I mean, we can't even conceive what's happening here. God Almighty, Almighty God, who spoke the universe into being, would get up off of his throne, come down to earth to be hungry, thirsty, to be ridiculed, to, to, to be scorned, to be rejected, then to be beaten, to be punched, to have his hair plucked out, his beard plucked out, and then to be nailed to a cross, naked, Scorn and shame, he still embraced the cross for your sake and for my sake. For your family's sake and for my family's sake. Is it too much for him to, or, or, to ask us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him? I say these little things that we have to go through now, I, I agree with Paul, they don't even compare. They don't even begin to compare with all the goodness that Jesus has in store for us. And on the same token, they don't even compare with what he went through when he didn't have to. He was God. But if he wanted us saved, and he did, he had to endure that. So take up your cross. Do not hide your faith. Do not dig a hole and put that faith in there so that nobody knows. But die to self. And live to Christ by loving him. By being obedient to him. So I want us just to take a moment to consider all of that. I want us to consider in our own mind, just for a moment, all that Jesus has done for us. All that he did. And what he's asking from us in return. Now, could it be that our faith is hindered because we think too highly of ourselves? And thus, we let our feelings get in the way. And thus, our faith, oh, pistis, suffers. Because we refuse to die to self. Are we letting our desire for praise and for the respect of people over that of Jesus hinder our faith? Are we letting political correctness get in the way of our mustard seed faith growing into the largest God?
garden plant, which is the mustard tree? Are we letting all of those things get in the way? Are we hiding our faith? Are we hiding that talent in the ground? Are we stifling Ovopistus? Let us look at this third servant who did the opposite of the first two. Let us look at what happens when we stifle faith, when we do not act out our faith. Well, the translation says that he went, but it is not the same went. It is not even the same Greek word. It's something close, but it's different. And I want us to discuss that just for a moment. That went means to, to go away or to go. So this servant went away. He was not active. He was passively. He took it. He received it. And he just went away. And what did he do? He dug a hole in the ground and he buried his talent. He did not even share his talent with anyone else. He did not share his faith. He did not pray for those in need. He did not reproduce. In other words, it was dead because anything that is alive reproduces itself. It's those things that are dead that do not reproduce. He did not multiply. Those things that are blessed multiplies. Because he did not share his faith. He did not share the good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He did not minister to the lost. He did not clothe the naked. He did not take care of the widows. He did not give to the poor. He did not heal the sick. He did not drive out demonic spirits. He did not drive out unclean spirits. He went to church, maybe, and he just sat on the pew and did not even pay his tithes. He did not contribute to the building fund. He did not contribute to the missionary fund. He contributed nothing to the kingdom, yet, he wanted to be let in. Isn't that like us today? We don't want to contribute. It's, it's, it's like the hen who, who asked all of the farm animals to help her bake the bread. Nobody wanted to help her. Nobody wanted to help her plant the seeds. Nobody wanted to help her water the, 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 the wheat as it grew. Nobody wanted to help her reap the, that, that wheat, the, the wheat harvest. Nobody wanted to help her knead the dough. Nobody wanted to help her make the bread. But when it was all done, they all wanted to share. They all wanted to participate. And so it is with some Christians today. They, they refuse to participate in kingdom work, yet they want to share in the glories. They want to share in eternity. Jesus said that that servant was a wicked, lazy servant. And he lost his eternal life because of his slothfulness. Even if it was because of fear. He feared the master. People today fear the masses. They fear social media. They fear the government. They fear the laws. But we cannot let fear of any kind, not even political correctness, keep us from doing all these things that we just mentioned. Casting out demonic spirits. You try to cast out a spirit today and the whole world, even some of the Christians, jump on you and ridicule you and try to make you feel small, make you feel stupid, make you feel like a heretic. 
We cannot let fear of political correctness keep us from doing those things that our Lord and our Savior, our Master, has told us that we have need to do. We need to walk in signs and wonders and miracles. We need to lay hands on the sick and see them recovered. We need to cast out spirits, demonic spirits, evil spirits, unclean spirits. Cast them out in the name of Jesus. If we don't, it will cost us our all. I want us to look at, at that last portion of scripture that we read. Matthew chapter 25, verse 28 and 29. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. It will be taken away. What The little that he does have, it will be taken away from him and given to the one who already has. That that one will have even more. See, the one will do something with it. The one who would have done something with it. Give it to him. So the reward that he would have gotten the, war, the, the, the rewards that he could have built up, all the treasure in heaven that he could have built up, will not be given to the one who did build up treasure in heaven. But for him who refused to build, who refused to work, he will be cast into outer, outer darkness. A very, very frightening thought. So the bottom line is this. Faith cannot be hidden. It is given to us to grow. We're to nurture it. We're to grow it. We're to increase it. It is like a mustard seed that starts out really, really, really small. It's the smallest of all the garden plants. But it must grow into the largest of all the garden plants. And when it's fully grown, it is ministering. It ministers to other people. Other people benefit from your faith. And that's why we're given each a measure of faith. Not just for us, but for others, for the church. We're to build up the church. So let me ask you, do you have that kind of faith? That mustard seed faith that can move mountains. Is that faith growing in you? Are you reproducing? If you aren't or if you don't have it, you can. It all starts with Jesus. You have to start with a relationship to Jesus Christ. The one who died for you. The one who loves you unconditionally. He loves you unconditionally. He's holding out his hand to you every single day. And he wills that you would come. For it's not his will that any should perish. It is his will that all come to repentance. That all gain eternal life. But you must accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That is where it starts. Again, he's the one who paid the price for your eternal soul. So if you would like to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, all you got to do is to repeat this prayer with me and believe it. Mean it in your heart. Repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I ask you to Help me to grow my faith. Help me to be a witness for you. Help me to be unashamed of you and of the gospel. Give me boldness and confidence that I might reproduce, that I might double, that I might increase. And I thank you now for eternal life. 
In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I would like for you to do is to get yourself a Bible. You've got to get into the Word. I, I can't stress how important it is for you to read the Scriptures, grab a highlighter, and highlight those portions of Scripture that is meaningful, that, that, that helps you in time of trouble, time of temptation, time of, of depression, when you're down, when you're sad, even when you're happy. There's Scriptures in there that, that helps you to rejoice that brings you up when you're down, that helps you to overcome sin, overcome temptation. You've got to get into the Word of God. It helps you to build faith, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We're going to talk about that in, in, in one of our um, coming up videos in this series. Then I want you to find a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches, but a Bible-believing churches who believes in faith, mountain-moving faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. The Lord loves you. We love you. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold to Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.